Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, we're now on the second part of this afternoon's proceedings, and this is the accessibility panel. We have four of our wonderful experts here will be helping you to understand how to make WordPress more accessible. Um, as I said uh, earlier on, I shall say it again, I am Nick Scarlett. I am, among other things, an access consultant. I tend to work in the area of buildings, of environment. Um, I've also now branched out into being an advisor to business, how to make their entire business model accessible, which has brought me into contact with the idea of making the web accessible. Because many of my customers will be worrying about how to make a building that they own accessible, how to make the office space that they have for their staff accessible, how to make the shop floor accessible. But one of the things that they seem to think goes without saying is that their online presence will be accessible. It's not something they even ask for. They just imagine that the web is magically accessible. So it's great that the WordPress community are making strides to try and improve what is still quite a tricky situation for some users. I'm going to just give you a few facts that there are in this country, in the UK, two million blind or partially sighted people. And there are eight million plus people who are deaf and hearing impaired, which means that, of course, all video content needs to be subtitled and all audio content needs to be subtitled in some way. 70% of disabled people have issues with walking and with mobility, and that can also mean with using their hands. So, of course, that means that quite a large number of people may have issues interfacing with keyboard technology. Of course, 1% are wheelchair users, but, you know, we, we don't talk about that because we're quite an annoying bunch. 3.3 million people have difficulties with memory, with concentration and with learning. So, the talk earlier about UX is quite important because a lot of people have difficulty remembering where they're meant to go on websites. So if a website is easy to understand, then you've made it accessible too. 10% of the UK population are dyslexic. And 4% are so dyslexic that they cannot read. So they have to use reading technology, assistive tech to allow them to read. Now, that's all figures and facts, but one great figure is Disabled people have annually disposable income, and this is facts by the government, of £212 billion. So we are a massive untapped resource. That's my little bit. That's the kind of thing I tend to do when I go up and talk to bosses and try to tell them why they need to be accessible. I hope that's made a little bit of an understanding for you. I'm now going to hand over to our panel to introduce themselves, and then we're going to kick off with some questions. So, panel. Introduce yourself. I'm only doing this because I'm very lazy and I should introduce you, but instead Thanks, I'll Rick. let you. Hi, uh, my name is Gary Jones. Uh, I'm an independent web developer. I've got a small team of subcontractors uh, and we build WordPress solutions for clients. Uh, my interest in accessibility uh, is wide ranging and obviously the web accessibility side of that is, is important too. Um, I don't tout myself out there as an accessibility consultant. Um, I think it should just be done as part of our everyday uh, solutions, the same as responsiveness. Um, I'm sure we'll come onto that as well, but that's uh, Gary Jones. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Senior. Um, I work for a company called Bluepoint. Um, I'm, I, I do basically design and development for that company. Um, I'm the founder of uh, WP Bournemouth, a meetup group in Bournemouth. And my interest in, or oh, I've been doing websites for about, since about 2004 on WordPress, but it's only last year at this um, Contributor Day where I was fortunate enough to sit with Rianne and Gary. And since then, my interest with um, accessibility has grown. And, um, and strangely enough, I was freelancing at the time. I, my motivation was to make myself, um, to attract more business. And, but with that, it's um, the empathy and understanding and treating people, not users, they're people. You know, they're, that's 
what you're building websites for, and that has grown. So thanks to these guys, um, you know, that's I'm here. <laughs> Hi, my name's Angie Vale, aka Purple Baby Hippo Web Design, and um, I build WordPress websites um, for small businesses and nonprofits. And I became interested in web accessibility about two years ago when I was asked to build a website which was accessible, and um, I didn't really understand. Well, I, I kind of thought I understood what that meant, and doing some research. Um, I um, found out how I had to, what I needed to do to make a website accessible and I was actually shocked to find out that most websites didn't have these features and they weren't accessible. So since then I've become really interested in the whole thing and it ties in with the whole user experience. Um, and for me it's, it's thinking about the end user, no matter who they are, how old they are, you know, so that they can easily use um, your website. So um, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from, really. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rian Rietveld. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, in case you couldn't tell. Um, I'm self-employed. I have got a small company and I build accessible websites in WordPress. That's my niche. I do that because that's very profitable in the Netherlands, because in the Netherlands, much um, websites need to be accessible. So I make a good living out of that. I'm also part of the Make a WordPress Accessible team um, and we try to make WordPress core more accessible, uh, do research and help by um, discussing and making patches. Um, so that's what I do. Well, thank you. That's our panel. Now, I'll tell you what, I'll, give, I'll let you have that because I've got, I've got my own, you see. I'm, I'm, I've got my own clip on one. Um, hey. Which means they can't shut me up. They're just going to push me off the stage. We've already agreed that. Um, I wonder, does anyone have any questions to start off with about accessibility? Right. No. So I shall ask some. Well, I think one of the key ones is, do you think there are any benefits to making ac websites accessible that brings to your creative practice? It's all right. We always talk about what we're doing for the user, but how does it help you? Well, for me, it's, um, it's really helped me actually think about user interface as a whole thing. Um, so rather than just happily, you know, just building a site and not really thinking about the end user or just listening to what the client wants, um, it's made me think always about the person that's actually visiting the website. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a disability. It, it just means um, everybody and actually making a website kind of a lot simpler um, and putting the content first which is what you should be doing it makes it accessible for everybody so it actually kind of has made it easier for me and it's also easier to explain it to the client because when they start to ask for fancy um, sliders or you know different gimmicky things I can always say, well, we need to think about the end user. That's the most important thing. It's the experience that they're going to have when they visit their website. That's, you know, that journey needs to be as simple as in, and as effective as possible. Yeah, um, I agree totally with Angie. It, it, it's a win-win. Once you start digging into it, you realize that um, making, it's the words, the kind of, Accessibility is judged not just on your HTML code, it's the content as well. It's the whole thing. And um, looking at the words you use, uh, making the words smaller, easy to understand, it's probably a good idea to think you're writing content for a child, you know, because some people um, have trouble uh, reading. Um, so, it, and that simplifies things, which works well for mobile, which um, yeah, I, I find it really helps. It helps you focus on what, what's really important about that page. And um, yeah, it makes it easier, I find. Yep, so use, Richard said about kind of using smaller words. Um, I can't remember the exact name of the society out there, Plain English Society or something named like that, um, who encourage kind of not to use technical jargon, um, as well as making it easier for those who struggle with either reading longer words or comprehending um, technical jargon, just having that in mind means that the, the content out there is, is generally simpler to, to follow. 
I'm not a designer. I have no design skills whatsoever. So if when I'm considering kind of the output that the backend code might be putting out there, I'm thinking about I'm not thinking about the visual. I'm not thinking that a download button might just have a down arrow on it. Um, I've not got to that stage. That's that's for somebody else to consider. All I'm thinking is, is it clear from what I'm outputting within the HTML that this is a download button or some other kind of interface? Um, how you then pretty that up, as uh, it might be from the, for the front end side of things, is a second stage. But by considering the um, kind of break it down into the two stages, you end up with something that is more accessible by default. The other um, thing about kind of creative process and we're talking about the content is accessibility or having a website that caters for accessibility isn't just kind of the technical aspects, but it's also the, the content within that page that caters for the accessible uh, or the users that need that accessibility inf information. So the WordCamp London uh, page uh, or the website, we've got a couple of posts on there and pages on there that specifically address the information that certain groups of, of people might need. Um, so it might be where the disabled toilets are, or the fact that there are disabled toilets, where is accessible by wheelchair, where is the nearest accessible um, tube station. Um, because it's not the local one. So being aware of that, the fact that there's kind of hearing loops in these rooms and catering for that, that we um, were accepting kind of guide dogs uh, and dogs for the deaf um, and catering for uh, other groups in a similar sort of manner is showing an awareness of your audience. Um, in this case, it's the physical audience who are, are going to turn up to the event. But likewise, you can also cater for an audience who would be turned up to a shop or you otherwise use your kind of physical services. Do you want to say anything, Rianne? I'm not a designer. <laughs> oh, really? There you go. So, cause one of the things you were saying was that, Rianne, was that it, in the Netherlands, it is legally obliged to make websites accessible. For government, yes. For government websites. Because yeah. it, it's interesting for me, because obviously, you know, I, I deal a lot with business, I meet a lot of business customers, and under the Equality Act in England, we have a situation where if you provide goods or services since 1996, they should be accessible unless there is a reasonable reason why not. And I think that's why a lot of my customers are under the, under, under the impression that websites are automatically uh, accessible because to them, they're thinking of, I can't change my building because it's going to cost me hundreds of thousands of pounds. What barriers are there? to making a website accessible. Why is it, has it, why do you think it's moved so slowly? Because it's very hard. Right. And uh, a lot of developers don't know what to do. Um, I don't know how it is in England, but in the Netherlands, the education of web developers don't include, ex uh, include accessibility in their program. So all the new programmers who are coming out of school don't have anything of any knowledge about accessibility. So when I come to an agency and I tell about keyboard accessibility, just try yourself if you can access everything by keyboard only. Really? Oh, is that a way to test it? So they just don't know. Um, I've got, um, uh, I, I'm doing reviews for themes to see how accessible they are. And um, experienced developers still use tables for layout. That really surprised me because that's really old-fashioned and it's not accessible. So what I think is we need to educate, educate the developers. That's why we are here, why we're doing talks. I think we need to say this is how you do it. Because it's sometimes just easy things like when you have um, a key, when you navigate by keyboard, sometimes you don't see where you are because in the CSS there is a hoover of, um, change, but not a focus change. Just if you have in your CSS a hoover, also add a focus. That's just one line extra, and suddenly someone who accesses the site with keyboard can see where she is. So it's a question of educating. It's very interesting because it's exactly the same for architects. Um, most of the architects I know have got their um, REBA degree, they've got their qualified as an architect. The access module is a extra module that you take, you don't learn it it's not, as part it's of the course. It's not uh, something so, you need to so, take. So it's very interesting that the web design is it's the same, because 
it does mean, as you said, that, that people don't even know where to start. Yeah. But I think that's one of the reasons why WordPress d d developers have you know, got something to be really proud of, is the fact that you are, as a group, really proactive. There's a much, more, a much stronger drive here to do something about this than there is in, well, let's say in the architect's world. Uh, don't quote me on that, folks. But, um, so what, how do you test um, a site to see if it's accessible? What, what, what sort of, um, what tools are there to use? Yeah, well, your keyboard. That's the first thing. Everyone has a keyboard. Try tabbing through your site and see if everything is access, uh, accessible by keyboard. You can use the tab, you can use the enter, you can use the arrow keys. With those, you should be able to access all uh, essential functionality. That's, that's, uh, the, if that works, mom, that it's a huge part of the accessibility. If that works, it's done. So that's how uh, you easily test. And there are different kind of tools like Wave. That's an extension for your browser who gives all information about uh, what can be wrong. So maybe you have other, any other tools. One, anyone else got any tools they use, Gary? Uh, there's a couple of, uh, there's another Chrome extension as well, um, accessibility developer tools. So those of you who are familiar with the, the Chrome dev tools, um, there's a, an extension for Chrome that adds an extra panel, uh, and that will look at what the um, screen reader text would be um, when you select an element in the Chrome dev tools. Um, and it also has a built-in uh, color contrast uh, analyzer. Um, one of the issues for accessibility for, for some users is the difference between the front, uh, the foreground color and the background color in the fact there's, there's very little contrast between the two. Um, so often you might see kind of light gray text on white. Design-wise, it's probably fantastic, but accessibility-wise, it's, it's really, really bad. Um, so being able to see the difference between the foreground and background color and uh, within the, um, the, the WCAG, um, specifications, there are contrast levels, um, algorithmic levels um, that you can calculate that has that kind of value that it'll work out automatically. So that's, uh, that's one extra tool. Yeah. Work, one simple thing is to just disable your style sheet and look at the, the raw HTML and validate your HTML. And that's not only good for accessibility, is uh, the Google uh, Webmaster guidelines recommend that. So that could possibly improve your SEO. Um, so there's, very, there's some really simple things you can do that are sort of the low hanging fruit of accessibility, but they go a, a huge way. And so start, you know, if anyone's new to this, I would start with these, um, make sure you work. Um, it works with just the keyboard, you know, that's very important. And then the structure of the HTML, your heading tags are very important for people. Um, so that's where I, I would start. And then it's a practice, you learn a little bit and you can start digging into deeper issues. But like Gary said, the color contrast is very important. Um, you know, as you get older, you, like me, I'm approaching 50 and I, I had excellent eyesight when I was young, um, but now I, I wear glasses on the computer, and uh, because and a lot of people are like me, and uh, your your boss or the client is possibly my sort of age, and so increase the font size. Most people, not many people, um, you know, not many people will complain that your font is too big. So um, yeah, it's simple, you know, it's simple steps that anyone can learn that and just. And then you start learning a bit more. Yeah. Uh, also, um, you can use voiceover software. There's a Chrome extension, which is just um, like a browser voiceover. And I use um, voiceover on my Mac just to basically read what's on the web page. And that's actually quite good for your copy as well, because if you, you think it all makes sense, and then you shut your eyes, and you actually listen to your website being read back, and you think, Wow, that's really confusing, and that's not what I meant to say at all. So, it, you know, it's a, that's that's quite a useful thing to do. Right. Let's see. Are there any questions in the audience yet? Oh, yes, we have a few now. All right. Let's go to Graham because we'll make sure he's a super expert. Kind of, we're all getting nervous now. Got <laughs> what he's going to. Thank ask. you very much. Um, <laughs> my question is. Um, 
to, I haven't been as active in the Make WordPress Accessible team myself recently, um, but I know that uh, Rianne and the team have been doing a lot of work with testing sort of key parts of the admin functionality. Um, I was going to ask if uh, where you see that going next and whether that, um, whether also part B of that question is whether or not you've, there's been any, any testing um, with regard to Calypso uh, yet, which is, I believe, the new um, admin interface or potential admin interface. Okay, I, I want to start with Calypso. Calypso is WordPress.com. And that's something from Automatic, and that's not something we want to contribute to. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think um, how it's going with WordPress.org, just the core is very good. Um, I'm very optimistic. Um, lately we had uh, in added to the standards, to the core standards, uh, WCAG 2 AA accessibility. So who knows what WCAG is? Okay. I was just going to ask that, but please tell us, for those of us like me okay. that don't. <laughs> You have the W3C web standards, if you, that are the standards you, uh, for your HTML, uh, so your HTML is properly. You have also the WCAG standards, that's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and they say, okay, then your content, your web content, your HTML is also accessible. So then you have three uh, levels of accessibility, A, double A and triple A. A is basic accessible, um, triple of double A is standard accessible. Most countries in the world have WCAG 2 AA as the accessibility standards for their websites. So uh, then you have triple A and that's for just dedicated uh, special um, applications. That's not done for a, a real website. So everything that gets into WordPress core new and everything that's been updated has to comply with WCAG 2 AA standards. So everything get, gets more and more accessible. Each time WordPress is updated, all new features, everything gets more and more accessible. So I'm very, very hopeful for the, for the future. And also, if a non-accessible feature um, gets in or uh, someone wants to get, in, uh, get it in, we can say, no, that's not according to the core standards. So now we have something to say about, okay, that's not according to standards. So I'm very hopeful for the future. Was that your question? Thank you. Okay. All right, next question, one over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a question. There he is. Where is it? Who's got it? Me. There you go. Me. Right. So, yes. Can you stand <laughs> up, please? Sorry, it just makes it easier for us to see. That's it. So, of course, not if you can't. Right. <laughs> no, I Don't can. impress anyone. <laughs> but, you know, I just remembered I can't. Um, I was in the sun last week for saying I haven't got a leg to stand on on television, so I've got to be careful what I say. Please, yeah. I was just going to ask um, two questions, really. Um, Firstly, um, are there any kind of um, groups or forums or whatever where people collaborate <laughs> on um, accessibility and, and projects working towards improving accessibility? And secondly, my question was um, about how, how you go about testing accessibility with group, different groups of people with different disabilities. So for example, learning difficulties. Um, I, I think lots of us understand some of the issues um, that people with um, partially sighted or, or perhaps um, deafness have. But it, um, I have a daughter who has learning difficulties. Mm. So how would you um, test for groups of people with learning difficulties and those types of disabilities? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can you, can you, uh, uh, the first question was, Oh yeah, well, the in, in WordPress, the, for the WordPress.org, there is a Slack channel, and we have a channel uh, accessibility. And we have a, me a weekly meeting at Monday, 
And then we discuss things that need to be done, tickets uh, that we are working on, uh, we are writing documentation. So that is, uh, we are discussing what to write on the documentation. So now you're reading that. I was reading that all time. <laughs> you're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of wish um, the letters were sideways so I could read the questions and then you could read my answers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, if you are part of the Genesis community, there is also um, an accessibility channel in the Genesis Slack. Um, various countries have their own Slack channel and they have accessibility channels like the Dutch um, uh, Slack channel for the WordPress community has an accessibility channel. Um, there is a lot of information on Twitter. A lot of people uh, are tweeting about accessibility. You can ask them questions. And the hashtag is hashtag um, A11I. Why? Why? Yeah. Why? Okay. A11I. Why? And if you have a question on, on Twitter, there's always someone who answers that. Any other channels? Not necessarily kind of in channels, but I know that individual plugins, um, for instance, are taking an interest in improving the accessibility that they can offer. Um, I know that Easy Digital Downloads opened a ticket on their GitHub repo, uh, and it basically just said, fix everything for that accessibility. Um, I think part of the issue, we kind of mentioned it earlier about how do developers know where to get started, is the fact that there are this, everything that we're labeling with this banner of accessibility actually does cover a wide range of um, completely independent issues. So you might fix everything that really helps um, a, a deaf user, but you haven't actually touched anything to do with somebody who's got mobility issues. Um, so when you just kind of get a ticket that says fix all accessibility, they're kind of missing the point. I think you do need to break it down into, all right, we are going to need to fix everything, but we're going to break it down into let's fix, fix kind of issues with a certain type of accessibility, and then this one, and then this one, and this one. It might be done kind of all at the same time, but having that finer focus is, is what's needed for developers to do that. So um, if you can kind of get into one of these support forums, um, be it kind of a theme specific or plugin specific, or even just talking to kind of plugin authors, educating them about um, the fact that just fixing it for the one thing that might know about won't fix it for, for all of the issues. They can't claim to be kind of accessible ready or accessibility ready um, without having addressed kind of every sort of issue. I mean, I'd like to say that one of the things that I think is a really good idea is to contact, wherever you're based, contact the local disabled people's organizations, so DPOs, because basically what you're doing then is you're going straight to the people, the end user, um, and they will be overjoyed because they desperately want to make sure that they are involved in the process. We're a big fan of nothing about us without us. And so it's very great if you can get it during your design process, especially during your testing process, go out, find your local disabled people, uh, people's organizations, ask them to get involved. They will give you fantastic input. They'll give you great ideas that probably haven't occurred to you straight off the bat. And if you can do that, at the, my advice would be do it in the design phase. Just say with, you know, put a tweet out, put a call out on the internet, loads of different places, even just go online and Google local disabled people's organization. Contact them, say, I'm looking for people that might want to help me with the project. Then they will give you ideas because we tend to end up in a situation normally where things are, solutions are given that normally tend to be very, very big. And we're always like, well, all we really needed was something really little. Like, you know, Gary was saying, we don't need a big whiz bang, we just need the contrast to be better with the font. You know, it's that simple. And with learning disabilities and difficulties, there are um, a standard for, for easy read. And it's really good if, you, if you're content in, in providing content in any way, source, look, Google easy read, and there are set formats of how to do that. And one of the things that they do, uh, most um, uh, information now should really be provided with an easy read alternative so a lot of government documents have an easy read alternative and what that tends to be is it gets the basic information broken down into a really easy to read format 
and then pictures next to it to allow someone to understand. So say you're talking about using the bus, it will have a picture of a bus and then it will have the basic information you need. And that's really useful, because like you were saying, if you're trying to make something, don't overcomplicate something. If you understand Easy Read, it means you can make your content entertaining, fun, very short and easy for everyone to understand. Well, I was, um, wanted to add something about the testing. If you want to have user testing, it's very difficult uh, if you have very many uh, different types of disabilities to get good tests. And you have to have very specific questions to those people. If you say, okay, look at my site, does that work? That, that doesn't work. You have to say, can you find the telephone number? Uh, it's a very specific task you have to give them. And then you get really information on how people find things or not find things or go behind them, uh, stand behind them and say, okay, go to the contact page. And then you're, <laughs> don't say anything. So don't say, don't put that button. So <laughs> you have to give them very specific tasks. And um, um, for the WordPress uh, core, we have about 70 testers with all kinds of different uh, technologies. Um, and it's very hard to uh, ask them exactly what you want to know. So it's, it's hard to get really good user testing. There are also disabled um, software engineers and WordPress developers out there. Um, another thing you might want to try, it's not exactly connected, but a, a group called Drake Music design assisted technology specific to music, but a lot of the people involved in that are also software engineers, uh, web designers, and they are very much in the process of designing very uh, focused systems. So, you know, kind of um, things like a sound beam to play music can also be used to operate technology. So it, it, there are people out there that are kind of very proactive in this field. And um, a lot of these people are actually designing the next generation of interface. So what, what works for us will eventually work for everybody. Um, any other questions? We have, well, let's go to you, because I, I mistakenly put my hand up before they go, you, could you stand up, please? Yeah. Just to, just um, to show off. <laughs> uh, it's uh, two questions, because the second part of the question might answer my first question. The first question is, is there a theme that's designed that meets a lot of the accessibility standards that anyone knows of? And, and then I was thinking about that. It, it's nice to have your kind of normal design for most case scenarios. Uh, if there's any WordPress developers that know, is there a way for the user to change the theme while they're interacting with a website? So you could have a disability accessible theme and then your own style theme and when they just press a button, that it actually changes the theme. That would be an interesting concept. Okay, so there are um, quite a few and a growing number of accessible WordPress themes now. Um, 2016, the latest uh, WordPress theme is accessible. Um, if you search in the repository under the tag accessible or access accessible, accessible. Ac accessibility ready, um, you'll see a number of um, You'll see the, the websites that do meet the standard. Uh, also, um, Genesis Framework, which some of us up here use to build um, websites, um, is, it, is now accessible. Has it built, has it built in? Um, so all um, Genesis child themes are accessible if you activate that part, which is now part of the core of uh, Genesis. Um, any others? Yeah, there's um, a good plug-in by Joe Dawson, uh, WP Accessibility, and that will generally improve, and you've got various options to set, uh, and like a toggle on the, to improve, uh, I think, uh, the contrast and uh, font size on the front, a little widget thing, so it does, that's very good. Um, the con contra to that is that all theme developers, if they have the education, it, the, the change they need to make to kind of meet that accessible ready tag isn't that tricky. Um, but the, the functionality that the, the WP Accessibility plugin is doing can be done within the theme. It's not one of these things that should only be done in kind of plugin specific. I think it might be a couple of little bits about editing the Tiny MC editor for H1 and, and so on, but it's not a, a, a massive amount. So um, the, the number of accessible ready themes is improving, is increasing, and that will only 
get more and more. Um, Matt Mullenweg mentioned it in kind of state of the word. He kind of specifically addressed the accessibility um, within WordPress core, and, and he was asked questions about that. Um, and I think slowly we are getting towards kind of that critical mass where enough developers um, and designers appreciate the the issues around ex the different types of accessibility um, and that will increase so if you can't find something that completely fits your client need at the moment it won't be long thank you um, I want to say um, in the repository there are themes accessibility ready that doesn't mean they are WCAG 2 accessible WCAG 2 accessible WCAG 2 AA is more than accessibility ready. Accessibility ready is just fixing the big issues, but it's not as good as WCAG 2 AA. So don't, don't say, from, okay, I've got an accessibility ready theme, now my site is WCAG 2 accessible. That's not true. So please remember that. <laughs> yeah, it's also always good to remember that the rules of what an accessible website is really change in the same way that the rules around everything change. So what we want to create a, uh, an industry that understands that things will change, as technology changes, um, as the needs of the users change, that so will the requirements change. Uh, as we have said, the, the, the standard accessible format is not fully accessible, it's just the standard, it's just the beginning of accessibility. So, and that's very much like it used to be with buildings, you know, once by the time you can build a ground like that, you now you can't. But, do you see what I mean? So it's really worth it. So it's worth keeping on the board and keeping up to date because you might think, oh, I know everything, and then suddenly you'll find that actually technology has changed and suddenly what you knew is no longer relevant or no longer what, what is required to be called accessible. Right, any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> so I was wondering, is there a cultural differences in accessibility as well? For example, in Asia, that you would need a different set of rules than in the US or in Europe. Now, Wake at 2 is worldwide. I have not a clue if there are different requirements. There are different laws, um, that you will be designing for, but um, it's quite interesting when you come to the legislation, because if you're, wherever you're based, you're, you would be covered by the law that you were working under, your national law. Oh, maybe um, for the Netherlands, uh, we have, uh, in WCA, have four principles. And for the Netherlands, if you build a government site, they invented the fifth principle to make it extra hard. I personally think that's not a good thing to do, but they, in their intimate wisdom, decided to do that. So it's very hard to make an accessible website for the Dutch government. And I hope they'll drop that soon. Right. Any more? Oh, Gary, 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 Gary. Certainly in the UK, um, as an equivalent to the, uh, the WCAG, which we've been mentioning, um, there's also a British standard. Uh, the British Standard Institute have come up with their kind of guidelines that pretty much kind of match across um, BS 8878, I think it is. Um, so that is something kind of obviously UK based. Um, other countries might have their own standards, whereas the WCAG is, is meant to kind of go across all the countries um, as well. Um, and as Mick said, the, the different laws will vary between the different countries as well. Not any questions anymore? We have, we've got one over there, back there. One over there. If you could stand up for us, please. Sorry to be a pain. Thank you. Sure. Um, I wanted to mention a tool I found recently which might help some people in here with making their content more accessible, which is on GitHub and it's called Clear Text. And it only allows you to use the most the 1,000 most commonly used English words. <laughs> so it kind of forces you to uh, simplify your writing a little bit. So that might help someone in here. But I suppose to follow on from that, a question would be, are there any sort of standards or principles that you should follow for making your content more accessible? Um, <laughs> um, so when for, for example, when you're um, doing a new static page or a post on your blog, um, then you should make sure that the content within that is 
semantically marked up correctly. So you should never use H1, for example, because that's um, either the site title on the home page or the page title throughout the rest of the site. So where you have in your graphical editor, you can um, mark up the headers in your content, you must do that correctly. So you'd start off with H2, for example, and then if you then had a subheading, that must be H3. So you mustn't jump. It has um, to be semantically correct, so that will definitely help accessibility. Sure. I actually meant in the context of um, for people with learning difficulties and things like that, for understandability of the content. To be honest, I mean, like I said, there are, I mean, there is the easy read standard. However, a lot, I mean, I, I write a lot for websites, I do a lot of content, and, and um, my editors basically tell me to keep the words down. Um, 500 words is probably maximum for a, an item if you want to make it easy to read. And basically, just to read it through, make sure it flows, keep all your sentences quite short, make sure you don't, if you refer to, if you're referring to a complex idea, try to break it down. Imagine you're trying to describe it, as was said earlier, to a child. And that's not in, not in an insulting way, but you're trying to, you know, you're trying to get across an idea. You want someone to understand your content. You want someone to enjoy your content. So it's, it's, it, if, if you see, I mean, I, I know myself, I'm quite guilty of, of finding myself writing very long. Has my microphone gone again? Because <laughs> I, I won't shut up, that's why it's, cause basically these guys have got me to shut up. I find myself writing very long um, sentences. So you have to stop and put the, the sentence, it's very much like doing comprehension at school. You have to make sure that you keep your sentences short, keep your ideas easy to understand, and try to make it enjoyable to read. And that's basically it. Oh. Also, it helps to divide your content into, uh, with the headings, short paragraphs, bullet lists. If you have images, give it an old text or to describe that's on the image. If you do that, then it's uh, readable and understandable for everyone. Um, also, just maybe get someone else to read it after you've written it. I mean, you know, you, you can get kind of wrapped up in your own thing um, and just get someone else to read it and see if, they, if it makes sense to them. I've, I've found it a, a great tool that Claire uses uh, in Claire's talk yesterday, Hemingway app. It's an app or it's an online version, but that it will tell you if it, your sentences are easy to understand um, and help you keep you, um, your words concise. So, yeah. uh, and even if you do do all that and you've got kind of really short words, simple sentences, bullet lists, headings, and so on, um, if the typography is poor, um, you may find that dyslexics just can't easily follow the letters jump around all over the place. Um, if you use all block capital letters, that makes it trickier to follow. Um, if you've got poor color contrast, that can affect kind of uh, dys dyslexics as well. So it's not just about the content, it's how you present that content irrespective of, of everything else that we've, we've talked about today. Thank you.